Hi, everybody. Nice Thank you. <clears throat> um, is this how it's going to be? Um, usually the way these things work is the, the more famous writer, who's Jenny, uh, interviews or has a conversation with the less famous one, who's me. But we're old friends and both kind of goofballs, and we thought it would just be more fun if we each read a little something and then talked for a while and took questions. Um, I also thought it would be more fun for me, if for no one else, if I read something new instead of uh, something from my book, which is now a year old. So I'm going to read you p two pieces, um, neither of which has yet been published. I, I released one of them as a download on my website, so this is a 99 cent value that you will be getting for free. Um, this one is called Up in the Air. <clears throat> Last summer I went on a book tour, flying to a new city every few days, sleeping in friends' guest rooms and backyard lodges. The difference in temperature between New York and San Francisco was 50 degrees that July, and for my first week out there I could not stop shivering in the chilly houses in gray clammy days. Eventually I adjusted and even got to enjoy my weird new transient life. It was like being on the Starship Enterprise, visiting a different planet every week beaming down to Zoe's house full of transgendered performance artists and sex workers in the Mission District, then to Zach's hippie co-op in downtown Seattle, then to a suburban backyard barbecue with Lauren and Lars and their six-year-old daughter. The only unchanging element left in my life was the drinking of coffee first thing every day, and I clung to it fiercely, becoming an instant habitué at a new cafe in every city, establishing a customary table, and forming a hasty crush on its prettiest barista. One other constant was the book I brought on tour with me, Kim Stanley Robinson's 2312, which inconveniently weighed as much as a ham, but proved to be ideal travel reading. Its characters are incessantly in transit, living in the vacuum between radically different worlds and lives. Robinson calls these intervals between stable periods the time without skin, the raw data, the being in the world. He notices how malleable we are at such times, how it only takes a few iterations of any action to form a new routine. How eager we are to throw ourselves into a fresh rut. How acutely uneasy we are with formlessness. We can't exist in pure chaos. One way to torture people is to interrupt their routines, deprive them of any dependable daily cycle. Our cherished habits are a kind of incantation against the frightening blank of existence. These times without structure or certainty are a glimpse of our lives as they really are. So terrifying, we can't stand it for very long, like looking straight into the sun from space. I never really came back from the book tour. What I thought was going to be a brief interval of uncertainty has lasted almost a year now. My next book contract was delayed, first by my publishing imprints unexpectedly ceasing to exist, and then by a hurricane. These are uncertain times. Both the economy and the climate are increasingly inclement. Currently, there's not one aspect of my life that is not unnervingly up in the air. My belongings are, store, are in two storage facilities in different states. I'm subletting a friend's place while I wait to find out what my next advance will afford. I can't remember which zip code to key in when I'm asked for credit card information. Because I don't even know what city I'm going to end up in, I can't fairly commit to a relationship, and my conversations with the woman I've been seeing are starting to feel like making small talk with the landlord when you both know you're three weeks behind on the rent. My mother is meanwhile selling off the farm where I grew up, the place I imagined I'd always have to go back to in case adulthood fell through. Every object in the dilapidated A-frame cabin that has always been my fallback residence, from the water pump to the telephone to my foot pedal pump organ, requires, quote, a little trick to operate. Mom is pressuring me to tear the whole thing down and rebuild. The one constant in my life for the last 18 years, a cat whom I've dragged with me from one sublet to another like Celine's long-suffering Beber, has failing kidneys. Most of my friends are artists of one sort or another, and our lives tend to be more unreliable than most. Peripatetic and improvisatory, living from one deadline check a residency to the next. Never able to see more than a few months into the future. Sarah, a graphic memoirist, wrote me on her way from a comics festival in Buenos Aires to a cousin's guest bedroom in Chicago. I know better than by, by now than to expect to have a real plans in my life like an adult. It was hard to tell over email whether to read this as cheerful or glum acceptance, but any kind of acceptance puts her ahead of me. Although I'm unqualified to do anything useful, I'm also temperamentally ill-suited to the chronic insecurity of an artist's life. I require a boringly comfortable environment in which to work. Cozy HQ, fixed habits, a core of friends, a lot of coffee, my beloved cat. Not having a place where I can hang things on the walls or being able to make plans more than two weeks in advance makes me antsy and uncomfortable, a little the way I felt when I couldn't shower for a week after Hurricane Sandy. All of which is not to complain about the terrible problems of being a writer, which I should, after all, count myself lucky to suffer, 
But lately, quite a lot of people, not just those of us who've knowingly condemned ourselves to it, find themselves in similar situations. Some of my former colleagues in the publishing industries, industry are now glumly contemplating careers in economics or ikebana, or have, in some cases, literally gone into seclusion. This recession has marooned masses of Americans in between, between homes or careers, forcing them to improvise new lives and wearily reinvent themselves in middle age. These times are nerve-wracking not only because of their uncertainty, but because of their unwelcome freedom. It's much easier to keep your head down and your eyes forward, burrowing ahead even in a course you're no longer certain of, than to have to look up from your life and contemplate the alternatives. The same way staying even in a hated job or crappy apartment is still preferable to undertaking a job search or apartment hunt. I keep thinking of some footage I saw once of a gorilla being released from long confinement back into the wild, who sat cringing in the safety of his cage, terrified of the open door. Being in between affords you the dreadful opportunity to second guess all your most basic decisions, to reconsider the fundamental premises of your life, face to face for the first time since your 20s with the big questions you hoped you'd already answered. What kind of life do you want? Uh, where will you live? Who should you be? Who should you love? Which is why I find myself considering implausible scenarios like taking over the family farm myself, opening an artist's colony, or moving to Reykjavik, entertaining fantasies that it's not too late at age 45 to become a different person. My friend Robin grew up in an army family and learned early on that she wouldn't live anywhere or know anyone for very long, that things like houses and best friends were strictly provisional, temporary. It makes me sad to know that she had to internalize this lesson so early. Kids like me with stabler lives were brought up with the delusion, comforting as a favorite blanket, that home and friendship were givens, fixed forever. But Robin points out that transience wasn't just a peculiarity of her own upbringing. It turns out to be the reality of life for all of us. Everything is contingent and ephemeral, and the flimsy little Potemkin villages of permanence we rig up for ourselves, real estate, possessions, tenure and retirement plans, Circles of friends and long-term relationships are easily demolished by layoffs or divorce, accidents or diagnoses, even on occasion non-metaphorical hurricanes. And if we're honest, most of those pleasant stable periods we look back on so wistfully exist only in retrospect. When we're in the middle of them, they feel as blind and confusing as any other interval of our lives. But years later, we misremember them as happy idols. I recall the writing of my last book as a time when I had an apartment and a com commute and disciplined habits and good friends, even though in reality that apartment got broken into twice and there were drug dealers out front every day and I was so lonely sometimes it hurt. The truth is, it's all in between time. I was anxious and uncertain for so long, going back and forth over the same decision so many times, that eventually I broke through into some sort of giddy despair. The day after Thanksgiving last year, my friend Harold and I were driving south on I-95 over the Susquehanna River on our way to Baltimore. Harold's in between right now, too. He has too little going on in his life, whereas I have too much, but neither of us has any idea what next. It had been a misty morning, but most of the moisture had burned off by now, except for a dense fog bank that followed the contours of the river. As we drove out onto the bridge, it was like flying into a cloud. We were completely enveloped in dewy gray blankness. Out in the middle of the bridge, we could see neither the bank behind us nor the one ahead. Only the bridge, a road stretched across nothing, vanishing into obscurity in both directions. Way up ahead of us, a tattered banner of clarity was streaming out from the bridge's edge where the mist split and furled around it. The replacements pleased to meet me was playing, which it occurred to me might after all be my favorite album in the world. I was in the car with my best friend listening to a song we both loved, and just inside that moment, everything was fine. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> uh, what do you think? Do we have time for one more short one or show? How do we feel? Yeah. Well, you're going out with me. You have to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Very well. Uh, we'll do another short one. I know we're supposed to bring our, our partners. <laughs> <laughs> you need a, a ringer in the audience. <laughs> Recently, I received an email that wasn't meant for me, but it was about me. I'd been CC'd by accident. This is one of the darker hazards of email, reason number 697 why the internet is bad. The dreadful consequence of hitting reply all instead of reply or forward. The context is that I had rented a herd of goats for reasons that aren't relevant here and had sent out a mass email with photographs of my goats attached to illustrate A, that I had goats and B, having goats is very good. 
Most of the responses I received expressed appropriate admiration and envy of my goats, but the email in question was intended not as a response to me, but as a forward to some of the recipient's coworkers, sighing over the frivolous expenditures on which I was frittering away my uncomfortable income. The word oof was used. I've often thought that the single most devastating cyber attack that a diabolical and anarchic mind could devise would not be on the military or the financial sector, but simply to simultaneously make every email and text ever sent sim instantly public. It would be like suddenly subtracting the strong nuclear force from the universe. The fabric of society would instantly evaporate. Every marriage, friendship, and business partnership dissolved. Civilization, held together by a fragile web of tactful phrasing, polite omission, and white lies, would disintegrate in a universal apocalypse of bitter recriminations and weeping, breakups and fistfights, divorces, bankruptcies, scandals and resignations, blood feuds, litigation, strategic nuclear exchanges, wholesale slaughter in the streets, and subtle lingering ill will. <laughs> this particular email was in itself no big deal. Tone is notoriously easy to misinterpret by email, and you could have read my friend's message as an affectionate head shaking as easily as a contemptuous eye roll. It's frankly hard to parse the word oof in this context. And let's be honest, I am terrible with money, unable to distinguish any amounts other than infinity and zero dollars. And I always seem to have the former until suddenly, and without warning, it turns into the latter. But I like to think of this as an endearing foible, or at least no one else's business, rather than imagining that it might be annoying, or worse, boring for my friends to have to listen to me complain about the state of the publishing industry and the impossibility of making money on the internet, while at the same time watching me blow my advance on linen suits and livestock rental. <laughs> what was surprisingly wounding wasn't that the email was insulting, but simply that it was unsympathetic. Hearing other people's tossed off opinions of you is an unpleasant reminder that you're just another person in the world. And everyone else does not always view you in the forgiving light you hope they do, making allowances, assuming the best intentions, and always on your side. The hardest disillusionment, incidentally, about reading your own reviews isn't learning that your book is bad, but that it's just another book, like a thousand others released this year. Perfectly good, but not Moby Dick. And soon to disappear without a ripple. There's something existentially alarming about finding out how little room we occupy and how little allegiance we command in other people's hearts. This experience is not a novelty of the information age. It's always been available to us by the accident of overhearing a conversation at the wrong time. I've written essays about friends that I felt were generous and empathetic, which they experienced as devastating. I've also been written about in ways I could find no fault with, but which were nonetheless excruciating. It is simply not pleasant to be objectively observed. Those moments when we overhear others describing us without censoring themselves for our benefit are like catching a glimpse of yourself in a mirror without having first primped, or seeing a candid photo of yourself online, not smiling or posing, but simply looking the way you apparently always do, oblivious and mush-faced with your mouth open. It's proof that we are visible to others, that we are seen in all our naked silliness and stupidity. Which, needless to say, makes us angry and embarrassed and damn the people who've thus betrayed us as vicious two-faced hypocrites, which in fact everyone is. We all make fun of each other behind each other's backs, even, well, especially the people we love. Gossiping and making fun of each other are among the most ancient and enjoyable human pastimes. And we should really know better than to confuse this with true cruelty. Of course we make fun of the people we love. They're ridiculous. Anyone worth knowing is inevitably also going to be exasperating, making the same obvious mistakes over and over, squandering their money, dating imbeciles, endlessly relapsing into their dumb addictions and self-defeating habits, blind to their hilarious flaws and blatant contradictions, and fiercely devoted to whatever keeps them miserable. And those few people about whom there is nothing ridiculous are far and away the most ridiculous of all. They drive us fucking crazy. It is paradoxically necessary to make fun of them in order to take them as seriously as we do. Just as teasing someone to his face is a way of letting him know that we've got his number, we know him better than he thinks, making fun of him behind his back is a way of bonding with your mutual friends, reassuring each other that you both know and love and are driven fucking crazy by this same person. All this sometimes, let's just admit, we're being mean. A friend of mine described a time in high school when someone walked up behind her as she was saying something clever at that person's expense as literally the worst feeling she had ever had. And not just because of the hurt she'd inflicted on someone else, but because of what it forced her to see about herself. That she made fun of people all the time, people who didn't deserve it, who were beneath her in the social hierarchy, just to ingratiate herself with her friends or make herself seem funny or cool. In C.S. Lewis's Voyage at the Dawn Treader, young Lucy finds a spell in a magician's book to tell you what your friends really think of you. I probably don't need to tell you that Lucy casts this spell to her regret. She gets to hear her best friend bad-mouthing her to try to suck up to an older, more popular girl. She understands that her friend is only weak-willed, 
not truly disloyal, but she also knows she'll never be able to forget what she's heard. This is black magic, the sort of thing we are not meant to know. A friend once shared with me one of the aphorisms of 12-step programs. What other people think of you is none of your business. Like a lot of wisdom, this at first sounds suspiciously similar to idiotic nonsense. Obviously what other people think of you is your business. It's your main job to try to control it, to do tireless PR and spin control for yourself. Every woman who ever went out with you must pine for you. Those who rejected you must regret it. You must be liked, respected, above all, taken seriously. They who mocked you will rue the day. The problem is that this is insane. It's the psychology of dictators who regard all dissent as treason and periodically order purges to ensure total unquestioning loyalty. It's no way to run a country. The operative fallacy here is that we believe unconditional love means not seeing anything negative about someone, when it really means pretty much the opposite, loving someone despite their infuriating flaws and essential absurdity. Donald Barthelme writes in the story Rebecca about a woman with green skin. Do I want to be loved in spite of? Does anyone? But aren't we all, to some degree? We don't give other people credit for the same interior complexity we take for granted in ourselves, the same capacity for holding contradictory feelings in balance, for complexly alloyed affections, for bottomless generosity of heart, and for petty capricious malice. We can't believe anyone could be so unkind to us and still be genuinely fond of us, although we do it all the time. Years ago, a friend of mine had a dream about a strange and terrible device, a staircase you could descend deep underground in which you heard recordings of all the things anyone had ever said about you, both good and bad. The catch was you had to pass through all the worst things anyone had said about you before you could first get to the best things said about you at the very bottom. There is no way I would ever make it more than two and a half steps down such a staircase, but it still makes for a useful metaphor. If you want to enjoy the rewards of being loved, you also have to submit to the mortifying ordeal of being known. That's all. Thank you. <laughs> Timothy Kreider. You are so good. Well, um, I guess I'm, I'm, the, I'm the closer. He's, he, he's pitched a good eight innings, but you know, he's tired out the arm. So, uh, I'm so excited about this new book. I see many of you have copies of it in your hand. Um, well, it's, it's not a new book, but it's new in paperback. And if you don't, if you don't know um, Tim's work, you're in for a wonderful treat. And um, the, the only trick will be not, if you start reading it tonight, the trick will be going to bed tonight without reading the whole thing because um, it, it just has a wonderful voice. Um, uh, as for me, I'll also read two pieces, um, uh, uh, and maybe later we can talk about what is the difference between um, nonfiction and memoir. Um, I guess I guess nonfiction is more true, but that's a professional difficulty. Anyway, um, I'm going to read you two pieces. They're both short, um, and they're kind of bookend pieces. One takes place um, in 1987. The literally weeks after I had finished being Tim's teacher at Johns Hopkins University. Um, and uh, the other took place um, last year. So <clears throat> here's the first one. Is there water up here somewhere? Oh, it's, oh, that's right on the floor. Thanks. Sorry. So this first one's called uh, In the Early Morning Rain. It's a, a, a revised version of a story that some of you may know from um, She's Not There. This was written, written as a, um, a piece for the, um, the It Gets Better anthology. Um, it goes something a little bit like this. <laughs> when I was young, there was a time when I figured, the hell of it. I'd never even said the word transgender out loud. I couldn't imagine saying it ever. I mean, come on, please. So instead, one day a few years after I got out of college, I loaded all my things into the Volkswagen and started driving. I wasn't sure where I was going, but I knew I wanted to get away from the Maryland Spring with its cherry blossoms and its bursting tulips and all of its bullshit. I figured I'd keep driving further and further north until there weren't any people. I wasn't sure what I was going to do then, but I was certain something would occur to me that would end this transgender business once and for all. And so I set my sights on Nova Scotia. I drove to Maine, took a ferry out of Bar Harbor, 
I drove onto the SS Blue Nose and stood on the deck and watched America drift away behind me, which as far as I was concerned, was just fine. There was someone walking around in a rabbit costume on the ship. He'd pose with you, they'd snap your picture, and then an hour or so later, you could purchase the photo of yourself with the rabbit as a memento of your trip to Nova Scotia. <laughs> I purchased mine. It showed a sad looking boy, I, I think that's a boy, with long hair reading a book of poetry as a moth-eaten rabbit bends over him. In Nova Scotia, I drove the car east and north for a few days. When dusk came, I'd eat in a diner, then I'd sleep either in the car or in a small tent I had in the back. There were scattered patches of snow up there, even in May. I kept going north until I got to Cape Breton, which is about as far away as you can get from Baltimore and still be on dry land. In Cape Breton, I hiked around the cliffs, looked at the ocean. At night, I lay in my sleeping bag by the sea as breezes shook the tent. I wrote in my journal or read the poetry of Robert Frost or grazed around in the modern libraries, great tales of horror and the supernatural. I read one of them up there called, Oh Whistle and I'll Come to You, My Lad. In the car I listened to the warlock sing in the early morning rain on the tape deck, which is a song that goes, <clears throat> In the early morning rain, with a dollar in my hand, and an aching in my heart, and my pockets full of sand, I'm a long way from home, and I miss my loved ones so. In the early morning rain, with no place to go. I thought about this girl I knew, Diddy Finney. I thought about my parents. I thought about the clear, inescapable fact that I was female in spirit and how, in order to be whole, I'd have to give up on every dream I'd ever had, except for one. I stayed in a motel one night that was officially closed for the season, but which the operator let me stay in for half price. I opened up my suitcase, I put on my bra and some jeans and a blue knit top, I combed my hair out and I looked in the mirror and I saw a perfectly normal looking young woman. This is so wrong, I said to myself in the mirror, this is the cause of all the trouble. I thought about settling in one of the little villages around there, just starting life over as a woman. I could tell everyone I was Canadian. Then I lay on my back and sobbed. Nobody would believe I was Canadian. <laughs> the next morning I climbed a mountain at the far northern edge of Cape Breton Island. I climbed up to the top trying to clear my head, but it wouldn't clear. I kept going up and up past the tree line, past the shrub line, until at last there was just moss. And there I stood, looking out at the cold ocean a thousand miles below me, totally cut off from the world. A fierce wind blew in from the Atlantic, and I leaned into it. I saw the waves crashing against the cliff below. I stood right at the edge. My heart pounded. And so I leaned over the edge of the precipice, but the gale blowing into my body kept me from falling. When the wind died down, I'd start to fall, but then it would blow me back up again. I played a little game with the wind, leaning a little further over the edge each time. And then, I leaned off the edge of the cliff at a sharp angle, my arms held outward like wings, my body sustained only by the fierce wind, and I thought, well, is this what we've come here to do? Let's do it. But then, a huge blast of wind blew me backwards, and I landed on the moss. It was soft. I stared straight up at the blue sky, and then I felt something. Are you all right? Said the voice. You're going to be all right. You're going to be okay. Looking back now, I'm still not sure whose voice that was. My guardian angel? The ghost of my father? I don't know. Does it really change things all that much to give a name to the spirits that are looking out for us? Still, from this vantage point, over 25 years later, 
My heart tells me that was the voice of my future self, the woman that I eventually became, a woman who, all these years later, looks more or less like the one I saw in the mirror in the motel. Looking back on that sad young man, I want to tell him, it will get better. It will not always hurt the way it hurts now. The thing that right now you feel is your greatest curse will someday, against all odds, turn out to be your great gift. It's hard to be gay or lesbian. To be trans can be even harder. There have been plenty of times that I have lost hope. But in the years since I heard that voice saying, are you all right? You're going to be okay. I've found, to my surprise, that most people have treated me with love. Some of the people I most expected to lose when I came out as trans turned out to be loving and compassionate and kind. I can't tell you how to get here from there. You have to figure that out for yourself. But I do know that instead of going off that cliff, I walked back down the mountain that morning and instead began the long, long journey toward home. Oh, that was a, a tearjerker. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and this is, this is from the new book, which, which, I, which is for sale in the stores. Um, uh, if you want to come home with two books, um, if, you can only, if you can only buy one, <laughs> tis, tis the man in white. Um, but, and this really is super short, and then we're going to get to the, to the conversation, which you were promised and which has yet to be delivered, I might add. So we will, we will deliver on our promises, I, I, I promise. But first, here's the, the very last um, scene of this new book, which is called Stuck in the Middle with You, which is about the differences between motherhood and fatherhood. Uh, the first chapter is daddy, or the first section is daddy. Um, the last section is mommy, and the middle section is called Maddie, which is what my children call me, their combination of mommy and daddy. Anyway, here's the last piece. It's called Anti-Venom. <clears throat> We were driving up a dirt road together, Zach and I, fighting about this essay he'd written for school. Where I'm going to be 10 years from now. His prediction? Australia. Developing anti-venom for the Australian death adder. <laughs> I offered my opinion. No. <laughs> you should be proud, he said. My son was 18 now. Me, getting a PhD in toxicology, helping to save lives. You're not handling poisonous snakes for a living, okay? You're just not. It's my life. I know it's your life, but if you're dead, it's my life. Plunged into darkness. I'm not gonna die. Of course you're gonna die! And, and, and you'll have to forgive me, but I, whenever I read this part of this, I, I always sound like Wally Shawn in The Princess Bride. Uh, of course you're gonna die! Australia has the deadliest snakes in the world! <laughs> Isn't that weird? I don't know why. <laughs> we were driving toward the cabin of his former fiddle teacher. She was having a party. My son cast a glance at me. You should believe in me, he said. Of course I believe in you. I just don't want you to get hurt. I'm not going to get hurt. You're going to handle deadly snakes. How can you possibly not get hurt? You pick them up with a long stick. Oh, well, long stick, that really puts my mind at ease. <laughs> he shook his head. He was irritated now. You don't believe I can milk the venom from snakes. Zach, you failed your driver's license test three times. You've lost every pair of glasses you've ever owned. Of course you're going to get bitten by a poisonous snake and die, and then my life will be plunged into darkness. <laughs> they have anti-venom for the death adder, he explained. If there's any trouble... I'll just take the anti-venom, okay? If they already have the anti-venom, why would you have to handle the snakes? I was pretty sore at him. I thought developing anti-venom was the whole point. Why would you handle the snakes if you already have the anti-venom? You're shouting. Of course I'm shouting! This is why I changed all those diapers. This is what I gave my life to. You, dead in Australia, poisoned, alone. He just shook his head. In lieu of conversation, he turned on his iPod, which was wired to the car stereo. The car filled with blarney, the pipes and the fiddles and all the rest. I guess his theory was a little music from the old country would soften me up. But he was wrong. Then, 
Something ran across the road before us. Zach jammed on the brakes. It all happened very quickly. One moment we were listening to Irish music, the next we were spinning through space, waiting to see whether we would live. We skidded into a ditch. From the woods, a coyote paused and looked back at us. I saw the wildness in its eyes. Good driving, I said. Excellent reactions. <clears throat> Zach started the car again and got us out of the ditch. We started up the hill once more. I told you that you could trust me, he said. A few months before this, he'd been admitted to Vassar College. Early decision. I loved telling people my son was going to be a Vassar man. <clears throat> now the sun was sinking toward the ridge to my right. The long, shining mirror of Long Pond was visible in the valley. Silence hung in the air between us, and not for the first time. My sons were leaving me, going out into the broad world. Zach, I said at last, if you really, really want to milk the poison from deadly snakes in Australia, if that's your dream, I'll support you. Thank you, he said, and rubbed my shoulder. That means a lot to me. I'll always support you and your dreams, I said even if your dreams are stupid. <laughs> My throat closed up, the tears rolled down. Of course, if it was the stupidity of dreams we were considering, I was one to talk. I thought of the hours I'd spent at Zach's age, lying in bed, wearing a bra, staring at the ceiling, imagining a world a whole lot farther away than Australia. We pulled up at the violin teacher's house right at the top of Buttermilk Hill. The pastures of her farm were all around us, and beyond that, the mountains and the lakes. Her husband's single-engine plane sat at the edge of a long field. A windsock dangled from a pole just beyond a field of tomatoes and cabbages. From the cabin came the sound of skirling mandolins and fiddles. My son looked at me, incredulous. You're crying now, he said, about me getting bitten by an imaginary snake in Australia. In the future, you're actually crying. A little. I wiped the tears away and we got out of the car. The sun was almost gone now, sinking behind the mountains. We walked toward the cabin. The music grew louder. His teacher was playing a reel, the farewell to Aaron. In the twilight, it was hard for me to see the stairs. I paused at the bottom step, unsteady on my old legs, uncertain. My son turned to me and took me by the arm. Come on, Mom, Zach said. I've got you. Thanks. Feelings, nothing more than let's feelings. Let's use the microphones. Uh, let's use the microphones. All right, so, Mr. Tim Kreider. I'm sure we discussed what we were going to talk about tonight over At the bar, yeah, night. that was yeah. great. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, one thing that occurs to me is that uh, we have both changed the genre in which we work. Uh, for me, it was, um, as, as a guy, it was, I wrote uh, fiction, and as a woman, I've written mostly nonfiction. You made an even crazier leap, although I don't know whether a trip to the hospital was actually necessary, going, is, there, necessary. is there an operation that, that ch changes a person from a cartoonist to an essayist? I don't know. The less you know about it, the better off you are. <laughs> so, uh, well, in, gee, in your case, it seems to me that that change was maybe because you, um, in a sense, you were able to drop the persona. You know, you were able to drop the mask of fiction and, and talk about what you'd actually been trying to write about the whole time. Because a, a lot of your fictional characters were people with secrets, I remember. Yeah. But, I mean, that, again, the, but I don't know that that, makes, that made that early fiction of mine um, unique. I mean, a lot, I mean, secrets are often what drives um, yeah. stories. That's true. But I guess somehow I did find, I found a voice that felt truer in the, in the memoir stuff. Um, but so, so did, did you find that you used the same skills? Um, it seems like a completely different skill set. It in seems that way to me too, actually. Uh, and I, I, I think if I were a greater artist, I could integrate those two parts of my brain somehow, but they don't seem to go together. Maybe just because I, I learned too much about writing 
go into a writing program and ideas that come to me for essays just seem like essays and ideas that come to me for cartoons seem like cartoons and there's no um, overlap there. I feel like it's a whole, I, I, I used to describe this metaphorically by saying that, that my cartoons were drawn by my younger, drunker, unhappier brother. Uh, but apparently <laughs> people, some people believed that I had such a brother uh, and that he was the guy who drew the cartoons. Um, I, I just feel like it was a whole different me who drew those, and I, I wish I could be as hilarious as that guy. You know, I try to well, be funny in my writing, but I feel like I, I get all stiff and serious and writerly when I'm being a writer, whereas when you're a cartoonist, you get to be just as stupid and puerile as you, as you <laughs> wish. If you haven't um, opened uh, 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 the, the collection, um, We Learn Nothing, you will see that it contains both essays uh, and cartoons, which is very cool. Um, I guess I just I want to ask you more about your life as a cartoonist. Um, how how was the? Oh, this so is like things. looking behind the the curtain at the sausage works. Uh, yeah. Well, I guess I'm. It seems to me that you're maybe your cart. Certainly, they're uh, funnier on the surface. But it seems to me that as a cartoonist, especially during the Bush administration, you were you were angry. I mean, there's a lot of my cartoons were always, fury. There's a lot my of fury in those cartoons. always angry and dark. Like in my first book of cartoons, which is not political, there's a lot of aggression and a lot of libido. Oh, and by the way, what was the name of the of the of the the original title of the uh, cartoon collection about the Bush administration? Well, there's two. What was the first one? The first one was Why Do They Kill? Oh, Fuck Them All. Yes, Fuck Them All. <laughs> I believe you are the author of Fuck Them All. <laughs> That's not what we ended up calling it. Y yeah. Really? No. Aren't there that, two was a, that was a limited edition. That was a limited edition. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've got the edition called... Something of a collector's item. Uh, so what was the second title? Why Do They Kill Why Me. Why Do They Kill Me, which is still a good title. Yeah. It's a great title, actually. So did you think that your cartoons just came out of a more furious place? I mean, the, the essays seem to me yeah. gentle. There's a, there's a real wisdom in them. Uh, and a, a, there's a... I don't think they were essays I could have written when I was young. They're, they're, for me, they're, they're middle-aged me's essays. I, I think, I don't know, testosterone's a dangerous drug. Oh, don't the, get me started. The, those of us here who are, who are currently high as kites on it. We've, um, we've finally found the subject upon which we, we each have an opinion. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's just like being on PCP all the time. And it, when it starts to leach out of your system, you find yourself thinking slightly more clearly. You think? Because, uh, I I know, know, I, you know, I, I just want to say, it's a slippery slope. Yeah. But, <laughs> you know what? You, I feel like those you know, essays You know what you are, gotta do, man. Or sort of a, you think I should just become a lady? Yeah. My, my sister... <laughs> That's your solution to my, everything, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> works, works for me so far. <laughs> my sister claims that I change sexes as a career move. Mm -hmm. well, my sister and I, who are not on very good terms, I have to, I have to add. Did get you on Oprah. I will. I'm yeah. not on Oprah. Not yet. But like I said, you know. Um, what were we talking about? The cartoons. <laughs> the cartoons that came from what I thought was a, an, an angrier... Yeah, I feel like the essays are my attempt to atone for having been so angry and unfair for so long. I felt like my intellectual conscience got the better of me, finally. And those essays are an attempt to be a little more fair-minded. You know, I don't and, think that's the empathetic. natural... I don't think that's the natural um, arc of uh, humorists' lives. If you think of... They get uh, angrier and more bitter. Yeah, if you think... Of, I mean, I'll name two, two at, at opposite ends of, of um, American history. George Carlin and Mark Twain. Mm -hmm. Both kind of began their lives as kind of happy-go-lucky, I wouldn't say goofy writers mm -hmm. or, or performers, but if you think about um, you know, you know, Twain's late essays and, and George Carlin, who just got, of course he was, I mean, he was, he was right, but I mean, the, the kind of, you know, that kind of funny guy who did the hippy-dippy weatherman mm -hmm. on the Merv Griffin show, you know, where was that guy at the end of Carlin's life? I don't know, and I was, I was, I mean, I always loved George Carlin, but I always felt that I, I kind of missed that, that kind of sometimes that sweeter, mm -hmm. that sweeter person. But you, well, I haven't, you, I haven't, I'm talking like Wally Shawn again, but you, I haven't lost any hair yet, and I, I haven't really started to go physically into serious decline. When that happens, I think you can expect a return of my angry bitter Wait, self. Did, didn't we have this thing about <laughs> what was that thing? This is, a, you know, Tim and I, I must say, uh, have um, had. Uh, Many occasions, as they, say in Ireland, as they say in Ireland, upon which drink has been taken. And wasn't there a plan that once we hit our 70s, we're going to become heroin addicts? 60. S get out! That's like five That's years from now. Carolyn Ewald and I are starting. I am totally not doing it when I'm 60. Well, I'm younger than you. All right. Fine, you can wait. Anyway. <laughs>
<laughs> Don't be bitter. <laughs> okay, fine. You become a heroin addict at six. I'm starting without you. Okay, well, you t- let me know how it goes. All right, I will. Okay, uh, you'll be like. I think my, my I think it's going to be this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fine. Uh, so, are we off topic now? I hope so. Um, I guess the other the other I don't question. Know, I feel like I got less angry partly because I just I just got a little older. And if you're lucky, you get a little saner with age. Not everyone does. I think you have to resist your insane tendencies harder as you get older because they want to get the better of you. Do you think that the kind of art that, that young people produce, young, what, is, what is young, say under, under 30, do we, do we tend to, is there a certain kind of built-in disdain for um, you know, wisdom and, and mercy and forgiveness and a kind of built-in adoration of anything that in, in any of its multiple ways says fuck you? Sure. I mean, you have less investment in the world when you're young. Like, you're just, voice, it, it's foisted on you, and it wasn't your idea, and it mostly seems to suck, uh, and, you're, and you're mad about it. Um, and so your art is not trying to make things better. Your art wants to raise things to the foundation and start over. Um, and the older you get, just the more invested you are by default in the world, because you live there now, um, and you're part of it. And so we've become defenders of the world? I wouldn't call me that. Well, I'm less invested in the world. I don't have kids, and I feel like I'm less invested in the world than you. I'm still perfectly happy to see it raised to the foundation. <laughs> <laughs> it can't get worse. I, I knew you first um, as an undergraduate at Johns freaking Hopkins University, and I guess I was wondering, um, I think about the relationships between teachers and, and students, and I know that I often hear the you know, the, the ghosts of my former teachers mm-hmm. whispering, you know, John Barth whispering in my ear, Edward Albee whispering in my ear. Although, you know, they're very different voices, you know. John, Good cop, bad yeah, cop. Yeah, well, yeah, John Barth is always saying, you know, make it more impossible to understand. Mm-hmm. And whereas Edward, Ed, Edward is usually saying, you know, that's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Just what, whoever told you you could be a writer? Mm-hmm. And I want to say, you, maybe? <laughs> Mm, I didn't didn't say that. Wait, you were, you were you had uh, we both had Edward Albee as teachers, right? Kinda. He dropped in <laughs> <laughs> to see if the kettle was still whistling. Yeah. Well, so do you, I mean I don't mean me, although I was your teacher. Did I teach you anything? Yeah, not about writing so much though. What did I teach you? You were an important role model for me as a, as a male a, role model. as a man. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I guess there's a, there's kind of an essay about that. I feel like the most important stuff I learned about writing was when I was about 14, and after that, it was just all practice. It was just all work. What did you learn when you were 14? Just the basic show, don't tell. That's it. Pretty much. Okay. <laughs> God, I hope everybody's getting this down. T- t- take out this, all, is, this is take great. out about half the adjectives. This is great stuff. Uh. So I was, I was, I know, it's like, it's like drawing. Once you learn drawing on the right side of the brain, then you just have to work, work, work until you get better. You're a great the, crosshatcher though. I mean, you're, you're renowned for your crosshatching. That's kind of you to say. <laughs> <laughs> so wait, let me, I want to go back to the, so I was your male role model? Uh, among them. It's possible I was barking up the wrong tree. I would, I would, yeah. <laughs> so did you? No, you're just someone who, I think the, the people who are real important to us at that age, like early 20s, are people who are doing something we can plausibly imagine ourselves doing, but they're not so much older than us that their lives appear to be impossible. Um, and, you know, you're about nine years older than me, and you were, you were being a writer um, and teaching writing, and a, that seemed like a life that was not painful to imagine having. Uh, and you had not, you know, somehow you just made it to the age of 30 without self-destructing. Which also seemed like kind of a long shot yeah. at that time. Um, so were you, I think did those you people feel mean a lot to you. They're just, they're just up there saying, just keep, you know, as, as your essay said, just keep going, it'll get better. The, it's, right. it's okay up here. It's not so bad. So did you feel betrayed when it turned out that whole, that actually, the whole time it actually sucked and I wasn't telling you? Well, I knew it sucked. I didn't know why. I, I thought it sucked for you for the same reasons it sucked for me. Just, you know. Being a person in Actually, the world. Do you remember? I, I think I remember. I remember saying this to you, and I remember you saying, "I never said that." But something like you said that I that I you. This is you talking. I felt. Let me try again. You said to me that we. Sh- you thought that we shared a sense of um, being disconnected from the world, mm-hmm. and that when you, when I began transition and started, you know, taking estrogen and you know all the other drugs. You, you take 
that make you actually like salad, um, <laughs> which is actually there's a lot of them that, to, to have that effect. Um, you said I wish that there was a and and I and I said you know and I was talking about well now I have the sense that I kind of fit in the world, mm -hmm. and I remember you saying I wish that I could take there was like a pill that I could take. Where yeah, well there are actually. Oh really? <laughs> <laughs> uh. Wow. You mean the whole woman thing was not yeah, necessary? I, I, I would say that I thought. Oh, now they tell me. I guess I thought we were both feeling estranged from the world for the same reason, which is the reason a lot of artists, well, probably just a lot of human beings feel estranged from the world. Everyone imagines that everybody else feels normal and, and happy, which practically nobody does. Um, but I guess I thought we, we just both were feeling peripheral for the same reason, instead of you for a radically different and specific one. Yeah, but maybe the, the things that make us feel like we don't fit, maybe it doesn't matter you know what what names we give to them specifically so I think that turns out to be true yeah. we were talking about secrets over beer number four last night oh, I remember and I think that sort of what one secret is is pretty much incidental but but having them and harboring them and sort of cherishing them in a perverse way is is nearly universal yeah it's amazing I, I, me I remember that feeling that uh, when I stopped having a secret life mm -hmm. I remember thinking you know about 90% of me was oh now I'm living my authentic life now I don't have to constantly be nursing the secret that I'm that I'm, you know, keeping every day from everyone that I love and care about. But there's a little bit, some, and I, as far as I know, um, transsexual, this transsexual women that I know almost never talk about this. Mm -hmm. But there's, and I would, I've never regretted transition for a day. I've never thought back about, you know, any of that. But I, there's something in me that, you know, having a secret life was powerful. I mean, it was, it was like being Peter Parker. Well, I think it that's was, probably part of the allure of all addictions. Like the, the actual substance involved in addiction or the, the practice is only some of it. There's the ritual of secrecy surrounding it that's, that's equally uh, intoxicating. I, th I mean, as a... And it, by the way, if you don't write about that, I will. <laughs> that's, that's part of my procedure that hasn't changed since the cartooning really? days. The secret, steal everything everyone says. Uh, well, I believe there's no one I've stolen more from than you. That may well than be you. true. Than <laughs> 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 it's the, you! It's the... It's the, it's the the pronoun you that apparently is the one that brings out the Wally Shawn in me. Maybe you should just start doing that instead of readings. Um, <laughs> our our but, hostess is looking at her watch. Is uh -oh, it perhaps that's time a bad for sign. some Q&A? Yeah, or, let's do some Q&A. At this time, if anybody has any questions for Tim or Jenny, we'll be taking them. Anybody well, any? what can we tell you? Can we tell you? There's one. I mean, this could be a very short answer. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> I mean, it's second album syndrome. Like, you use up your whole life experience in album or novel number one, and then what? Um, no, not yet. I mean, I, I kind of have some trust in the process, such as it is. Um, I mean, you know, Montaigne was a guy who just sat in his tower and read and wrote, and he didn't run out of stuff. He wrote essays on cannibalism. He wasn't a cannibal. Um, he, he just, he, he didn't run out. I, I, I have some faith in that it's, it's the workings of my mind rather than the material that comes before it that matters. But I could turn out to be wrong. It's possible I've just used up all the best stuff and the next book will suck. I, I think Buy it and see. I, <laughs> I, I think the more mysterious your own creative process is to you, the greater the fear that the well is going to go dry. You know, if you know, well, I've got that story I want to tell about, you know, at that time I was at the ventriloquist convention, and then I've got that story I want to tell about the, when I was a nudist. You know, you've got, okay, that's two or three things. But, it, you know, it, if, and I think Tim and I both do this, you kind of rely on um, ideas arising out of the murk in order to give you uh, not just your stories, but, but a set, really your, your whole way of life, your whole income. If, there, if there's a great fear that, that one day, one day that that you know that well will be dry and it's, it, I think it's, it's really scary I would say also in my experience oddly the best stories for telling friends in bars do not make the best essays or maybe even good ones uh, like I've been figuring out I've been trying to figure out for years how to write an essay about riding the Ringling Brothers circus train to Mexico City while posing as someone's husband years ago um, and you would think how could that not be a good essay and it turns out there's about a dozen different ways um, 
Like those stories main point is my life is cool and fascinating and that's not an essay like an essay can't be about me It has to be about you um, And so oddly the most unique experiences make for bad essays I've, I've actually had a hard time writing about some of the, the stuff that you and I have done together over mm -hmm. the years Which is doesn't always translate well when you try and tell it, other people it, it, People are like wow you're both a c couple of assholes. You're like <laughs> that's often the misapprehension people get there's a there's a there's a there's a, there's a there, as an example, one time... Don't tell whatever it is. <laughs> <about the> <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we'll just, we'll just move on. So I've, ne I've, I've, never, I've never been able to tell that story in a way that is anything other than, you know, this one t so one time we, we bought a couple of giant um, stuffed animals at a yard sale and then proceeded to You're torture the story. them. You're doing the thing I told This is a summary <laughs> of the story. Okay. Proceeded to torture them the rest of the day and pretend like we were in the mafia and we, were, we had to whack them. <laughs> And we wound up, we, one of them we tied a cinder block to the leg of the giant rabbit and threw it off a bridge. And the other, the, other, the other was a giant rabbit which we hanged from a tree holding a sign that said, here, here lies a, a lettuce rustling carrot thieving son of a, no good son of a bitch. <laughs> and, 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 and we have literally Thousands of stories like that. We could sing the Ballad of Dave Dudley. Yeah, like I could sing that. I'm going to sing that right now. Don't do that. The, <laughs> the point being that they don't tend to make good stories <laughs> when you try and share them with others. Yeah. Did anybody have any other questions? Go ahead. Um, yeah, in, in updating your life, uh, you know, people after this is me. Yes. Okay. Sorry. This is yeah. Uh, after the success of, of, of She's Not There. Um, well, I know we're, we're asking you to, to bring the story forward and how does it, what happens with your wife and so forth. And you elected instead the first time to write a book which was sort of a um, look back if anything, towards uh, uh, certain episodes in your adolescence and uh, a certain feeling of, of being haunted. Yeah. And then to bring things up to the present, you wrote this book about families. Yes. Which, of course, their families are central to so many people's lives and so many narratives about them, but this is specifically, I mean, it's about families rather than entirely, being entirely about you. I, sh I should probably quickly say there is now, as of um, a month ago, a new 10th anniversary edition of She's Not There with, uh, with a, new, a new final chapter. Um, that does bring that story up to date, and it also contains a new epilogue by my wife, who talks about, um, oh my God, what it's like to be married to me. Um, so the the funny thing about updating, she's not there for me, was that I went. I mean, it's it's kind of a thing. It, it sounds like a bad idea, doesn't it, to take a book that really worked and then to go back ten years later and add a chapter or two. Um, but um, and I and I knew I was kind of tampering with something and and you know who it's impossible for me to, to to regain the state of mind i had 12 years ago when i wrote that book but you know i i had enough questions ab about what happened later that it felt um, and i especially wanted Didi to be able to tell her part of the story because i think a lot of people who read she's not there had the sense that you know she was being held hostage you know or that i had her you know I, I kept getting this thing, this, 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 these emails from readers who would say, well, you know, Dee Dee's the real hero. I'm like, really? There can only be one hero in the book? Um, and so um, I liked updating it to give, to give her, to her, her, to her voice. Also, I mean, one of the things about writing memoir is that unless your life just happens to provide you with a magical last chapter, you have to find a way of finding a resolution to a story for a life that's still ongoing. So, sh and she's not there. There was a real sense that of, it was kind of a qualified ending. Um, but, you know, I, I, when I wrote that book, there was still a lot of things that were up in the air in our lives. Dee Dee and I were still in a fairly vulnerable place. And so I wanted just to write a story or to update the story to let people know that um, the dust did settle. And in time, we really did return to each other. So anyway, I'll bet if you hunted around the Strand, you could find a copy of the 10th anniversary edition. If she's not there, couldn't, couldn't, couldn't he? Yeah. Definitely. Indeed. Mm -hmm. no, 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 I'm sorry. I, I, actually, I was the sort of prologue to the question. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> wow. Sorry. I'm an ex-professor. Right? All right. Um, the, you, t 
talk in this book mostly I mean, about, aside from your own family, which seems to be a, you know, a been phenomenal success in terms of surviving and giving nurturance to all of your members, a lot of the families that you talk about in the interview people with, people with children, are dysfunctional. Family, some of them are family dysfunctional. And I'm wondering what do you feel that this the, the, the functioning of your family was somehow was, was, was very special or that you did something differently you and Dee Dee that made it work whereas others people didn't do it how, yeah. how do you think that, that, that things might have turned out if you'd had the Cyrus Simser problems as, 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 as some of the witnesses that yeah well um the things, that, very briefly, I'll, I'll, I'll say, the things that held our family together were largely um, two things uh, that I'll name were reading, that, you know, ev that f un, un, from the time when they were two until ninth grade, um, we read books to our sons every night for an hour before bed. I mean, always. We'd still, and the only reason we stopped in ninth grade was that they had so much homework that we just l didn't have that hour in the evening. And the other thing was food. We've always eaten together big breakfasts every day with, you know, bacon and sausage and toast. I mean, I mean we've always made a big deal out of breakfast and, and we eat together. Um, so that's one thing about us. But I guess I would disagree that the stories that I tell of other families are um, dysfunctional. The, I would say that they're very different, but there's, um, the, those stories are not presented as, ob of the, the, the book we're talking about contains interviews with other uh, what I call mothers and fathers and former children. It's not that they're dysfunctional, it's just that they're, they're unique and they're different. And the point I was trying to make is that um, there's no such thing as a traditional family. And in fact, one of the people I interviewed was Mr. Tim Kreider, who uh, in his essay in We Learn Nothing, uh, called Sister World, uh, talks about what it was like to be adopted and then to search for your um, biological mother and there, there's that part of the story, and then there's the wonderful twist that, in fact, what he also finds is the unexpected half-sisters. Do you want to talk about that essay a little bit since we have you? No, not with my half-sisters here in the room. Oh, <laughs> because I heard they were crazy people, and they were just in... Oh, and oh, wait, they're leaving now. There's that. Oh, wait, no, sorry. That's my former student. Bye, Molly. Thanks for coming. Okay, well, I think we have time for one more question, just right here. We learn nothing? Well, I mean, w one thing I learned from being a cartoonist is the, the cadence and just the snap of titles. Like, a cartoon title just has to have a good rhythm. It's got to be funny. People have to remember it. And We Learn Nothing was just kind of a constant vocal refrain uh, between my friend Boyd and myself during our late night phone calls. It was kind of the conclusion we came around to after every debriefing. We learn nothing. Um, and I don't know. Whether, whether it's strictly accurate or not is for the reader to decide, but it just made a good title. Are, are you willing to share the title of the work in progress? Yeah, my next book also, Boyd came up with the title, uh, which is, I wrote this book because I love you. <laughs> uh, and I, I think you're supposed to picture uh, me as a piteous person slamming a titanic thick manuscript down at the feet of some really embarrassed woman <laughs> 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 having crawled 1,000 miles to deliver it to her. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Thank you all for being here.